Our scripture passage this morning comes from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, verses 2 through 9. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them high up a mountain apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings for you, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You see, Peter didn't know what to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whether we recognize it as such or not, we have all experienced transformative moments in time when the trajectory of our lives changed. I remember one of my transformative experiences well. It was the summer of 1999, and some ELPC members and I accompanied Dr. Chestnut to Ghost Ranch, the Presbyterian Retreat Center in Abiquiu, New Mexico. While there, several days, I climbed up a mesa to get closer to heaven, to talk with God, and to listen to God about the course of my life, to discern where God was leading me. And even though it was several years before God's plan for me was manifested, God spoke into my spirit on that mesa. In the chapter that precedes today's lection, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah, and still others proclaim that you are one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked the disciples, but who do you say? that I am. And that impetuous and outspoken disciple Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now, although Peter answered correctly, neither he nor the other disciples really understood the full implications of what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah. You see, he was not a warring or avenging Messiah that the Israelites anticipated. The disciples did not understand that Jesus was the suffering Messiah who would be brought before government officials, falsely accused and convicted, beaten and crucified. Now we benefit from understanding the fullness of Jesus' identity of being God's beloved son, fully divine, and the son of man, fully human, even if the disciples did not. Mark writes that six days after Jesus' discourse about his identity with the disciples, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. One commentator notes, it is unusual for Mark to be so specific in identifying an itinerary. This is a sign that we need to pay attention and read this passage in light of six days earlier. End of quote. Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they ascend the heaven. David Jacobson comments, mountains are places of disclosure throughout the Bible. Anthropologists often tell us that mountains are places of meeting between heaven and earth. End of quote. You see, God spoke to Moses on the mountaintop and commended the commandments to him. And when Moses descended from heaven, the mountain after being in the presence of God, his face radiated so brightly that he covered it in the presence of the Israelites. When Elijah fled from Jezebel and Ahab in fear for his life, God commended him to stand on the mountain and that God would pass by. 
And as Elijah stood in the mountain crevice, the Spirit of God, it was not in the wind that split the mountain and broke rocks into pieces. God was not in the earthquake that shook the earth or in fire. It was in silence that God spoke to Elijah. I suspect that God spoke in silence to Fannie Lou Hamer. She was born a sharecropper or born two sharecroppers in Mississippi in 1917. She was transformed and gave, that gave her the courage, vision, and strength to rise above her humble beginnings and become a leader in the civil rights movement. She was fought for voters and women's rights. She was the vice president of the Freedom Democratic Party and organizer of the Mississippi Freedom Summer with the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee and co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. I believe that God spoke to Mary Lou. I suspect that it was in silence that God spoke to Bayard Rustin, a gay black man, transformed and gave him the audacity, the courage, and the tenacity to organize the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, to espouse Gandhi's practice of nonviolent resistance, and to help organize the Southern Leadership Conference and to stand for gay rights. And it was in a noisy worship service on April 3rd in a Baptist church in 1968 that God spoke silently to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, transformed and empowered him with prophetic authority, and that he preached that he had been to the mountaintop and seen the promised land. And although he would not get there with them, we would all get to the promised land one day. I believe that God spoke to Dr. King. Jesus was suddenly transfigured on that mountaintop, and his clothes became dazzling white. And then without warning, Moses and Elijah appeared. Commentator Netta Pringle writes, it is as if the earthly Jesus is stripped away and we see him in all his post-resurrection glory. Not only does the transfiguration point forward, it also points back to the pre-incarnated Jesus. We see him as he will be and we see him as he will was. We see the glory that God set aside to be one of us. End of quote. Now Moses and Elijah, they were the two prophets who defined Israel's past. And they're up on that mountaintop with humanity's past, present, and future God and Savior. Both Moses and Elijah had experienced God on a mountaintop during times when they considered themselves to be in danger and were experiencing discouragement. Moses came down from the mountain after receiving the law from God and found the Israelites dancing around with the golden calf they had fashioned as their God, and Moses went right back up on that mountaintop. Elijah was running for his life when he encountered God on the mountaintop, and God hid him in the crevice. William Plater writes, both Moses and Elijah turned away from the luxury of a royal court to take the role of outsiders, standing up against tyrants. People throughout history have chosen the less convenient, uncomfortable, and life-threatening decision to stand, to stand against racism in this country to stand against homophobia in this country, to stand against sexism in this country, to stand against everything that was not of God in this country. There are so many other things that people have stood for. Too many things to name in one sermon. However, most of the people who actively fought for full citizen citizenship for people of color in this country did so at great risk. And many of them professed that their relationship, hope, and trust in God is what gave them the courage, the power, and the authority to fight for what is righteous and just, and that it kept them even when they were thrown into jail, attacked by dogs, beaten by those who had sworn to protect and serve, spat upon and sprayed 
with water hoses because God had spoken in silence to them and given them everything that they needed to stand regardless. Jesus and his disciples would find themselves in precarious and dangerous and deadly situations as well. However, in this moment, Peter, James, and John find themselves on the mountaintop with Jesus, inhabiting a place of revelation and transformation. They were in a liminal space of a present mystery and the disclosure of what was to come in the future. This mysterious and apocalyptic occasion lies outside the normal experience. They had no former context, and so it was difficult to process that experience. Pringle writes that every moment we are in relationship with a God who is not in time as we know it, end of quote. Therefore, Peter's terrified response is not a surprise. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, Peter said this because he didn't know what else to say. He was surprised by all of this. And it was at that very moment that a cloud descended and overshadowed the mountain as a symbol of life, hope, and God's presence. And then God spoke, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, whatever your motivation for wanting to stay up here on this mountaintop, whether it is a desire to prolong your time here, bathed in the Shekinah glory of God and Jesus, whether it is a desire to be in relationship with Moses and Elijah, whether it's nervousness or just a misunderstanding, be quiet and listen to Jesus. He has instructed you and will continue to do so. But you must be quiet and listen. Yet, at that very moment, Jesus wasn't speaking to Moses or Elijah, and he isn't speaking to the disciples, according to Mark. For Jesus had already spoken and told the disciples what was ahead, his death, burial, and resurrection. Perhaps at that moment, the disciples were praying for an easier way out. You see, they still didn't understand that Jesus was a suffering Messiah who would break traditions, structures, and systems in his dying and resurrection rather than with traditional weapons of war. Just as they suddenly appeared, Moses and Elijah, they disappeared. And Jesus, Peter, James, and John made their way down from the top of the mountain, and Jesus ordered them, Be quiet. Don't tell anyone. The disciples had had a glimpse of the divinity of Jesus and a taste of heaven that day on that mountaintop. But they couldn't stay up there. Why? Because there was work to do down in the valley. It's time for us to come down from high and lifted places. It's time for us to stop being so heavenly bound that we are no earthly good. It is time for us to get to work down in the valley. Yes, mountaintop experiences, they fortify, encourage, equip, and prepare us for the work that's on the ground. And even though Jesus told his disciples in that moment to be quiet, our assignment is to tell to tell everyone about and to manifest the love of our God who has come near in the incarnation of Jesus. Our assignment is to be the heart, the hands, and the feet of Jesus on the ground, much like the people who risk it all to stand for justice and righteousness, like those who demanded equal rights and recognition, like those who knew deep down in their very bones that the work of God God that God was calling them to was dangerous. The transformational glory of God has shown up in cotton fields of the South. The glory of God has shown up in crowded churches in the sung hymns, prayers, and the preached word. The glory of God has shown up in meeting rooms as people strategize to change oppressive, unjust, and divisive systems and structures. And the glory of God prayerfully 
shows up here. Every time we walk through the door, every time we worship, every time we pray, every time we sing, every time you hear the preached word so that we are empowered to go out into the world and to share the love of God with all of God's people, period, full stop. The glory of God showed up on a mesa in New Mexico in the summer of 1999, and it changed the trajectory of my life. But I was quiet. I didn't tell anyone, primarily because I did not fully understand what it meant at the time. I didn't know what God was speaking into my spirit. And yet that did not prevent God's word from manifesting and coming to fruition in my life. Witnessing it right now. Beloved, be still. The glory of God is present with us. Be quiet because Jesus is speaking. Listen to him, and I guarantee you, we shall all be changed. May it be so. May it be so.